Hello, my name is Josh Martin. Welcome to my talk on spoken corporate data, automatic speech recognition, and bias against African American language, the case of habitual beat. Let me start with an outline. First, we'll talk about an introduction and study rationale. We'll move to foundational concepts. We'll talk about research questions. We'll move to methodology. We'll talk about results. And finally, we'll go over a discussion and conclusion. Let's begin with an introduction and study rationale. Racial bias has been found in algorithms across various sectors, such as in healthcare, judicial sentencing, autonomous vehicles, hate speech detection, search algorithms, and facial recognition, among many other places. But one area that has been largely neglected in many studies is that of automatic speech recognition. The tide is changing on this, however. Last year, an important study was published that examined five major ASR systems, Apple, IBM, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, and found that the, there was a much higher word error rate for black speakers than for white speakers, unfortunately. You can see the differences here. They are fairly um, large. And since many systems use word error rate as the benchmark for how well their systems perform, this is incredibly troubling. Other studies have begun to be published by various researchers in the field, but not that many papers have come out. So the rationale for this study, there are very few studies on linguistic bias and African-American language in automatic speech recognition systems. There are limited exploration of the causes of linguistic bias against African-American language in ASRs. Many papers postulate about the causes, but do not have the space or time to dive deeper into that. There are also no studies that focus on AAL morphosyntactic or grammatical features. Let's move now to foundational concepts that we need for the rest of the talk. First, we'll talk about what ASRs are. Then we'll talk about African-American language and what that is. And finally, we'll look at habitual B, the morphosyntactic or grammatical feature that I will focus on in the study. First, let's talk about automatic speech recognition. Automatic speech recognition is the process and the related technology for converting a speech signal into its corresponding sequence of words or other linguistic entities by means of algorithms implemented in a device, a computer, or computer clusters. You commonly know it probably by Siri or Alexa or things like that, but ASRs are moving far beyond the realms of virtual assistants to many places that affect our daily lives in important ways. Traditional ASR models use statistical models to uh, process speech, while more modern day uh, models are moving more towards neural networks and usually a combination of neural networks and hidden Markov models. Either way, um, each model is based on the data that they are giving, the training data. And if there is biased data within these sets, it um, can cause major problems of bias within the models and the performance. And that's what we're investigating today. Next, what is African-American language? African-American language refers to all variations of language use in African-American communities, recognizing that there are many variations within the umbrella term, which includes Gullah and African-American vernacular language or African-American vernacular English for those who prefer that term, as well as varieties that reflect differences in age, generation, sex, gender, sexuality, social and socioeconomic class, region, education, religion, and other affiliations and identities that intersect with one's ethnicity and race and nationality. So in this study, when we talk about the morphosyntactic features of African American language, what I mean to say is these are gr linguistically grammatical features that have been observed in various populations of African American speakers over time in different regions of the United States. It does not mean that every single African American language speaker has these features in their linguistic repertoire, not by any means. Individual to individual is shaped by all the varying identities that they uh, that are part of their experience and may or may not have these features. But our goal should be to work towards equitable ASR performance for all African American users of ASR systems, whether their linguistic repertoire contains the unique linguistic features of AAL or not. Again, I would like to emphasize that our goal is to work towards covering the entire spectrum of speech within the community, not just a certain sector. Now let's talk about aspectual or habitual B. Uh, let's start with an example, Angela B. studying. Many times when a person who is not familiar with African-American language or has not studied it uh, encounters a sentence like this, they will interpret it as Angela is studying, meaning it's the present progressive, it's happening at the present moment. 
This, however, is an incorrect interpretation. Angela B studying actually would correlate with Angela usually studies, meaning simple present happening habitually. Habitual B can happen with many types of predicates. I be feeling funny in the morning means I usually feel funny in the morning. Breakfast be cooked at eight o'clock means usually at eight o'clock every morning breakfast is cooked. I be tired doesn't necessarily mean right now, it could, but it means I am usually tired at a certain time. Uh, and he doesn't even be there means he is never there. Usually I be the one that have to go find everybody means explicitly here, usually I am the one that has to do it. Sometimes people be in village hall, sometimes they be at the dorms is made explicit again, right? Sometimes this is happening. So all of these predicates um, can follow habitual B and they can, the B in these instances carries the characteristic of the habitual. What does that mean? That means that this B is not just uninflected and is a, a correlate of the, the present progressive. It's happening right now. It is a, a different form of B that is unique to African-American language. And we want to be able to uh, make ASR systems equitable, equitable enough to be able to process grammatical features like this one. There are also non-habitual uh, non uninflected forms of B, such as B following a modal. Modals are words like will, would, can, and could, or the infinitival too, like I want to be your friend, or in the imperative, like be careful. However, these Bs, though they are uninflected, meaning they're not changed in form, are not the same as habitual B because they do not express the habitual aspect. These express different forms of mood and things like that, but not the habitual. So that's the difference. If we have training data that has a lot of instances of, for example, the present progressive, but only one instance of the habitual B, we know now that the habitual B there um, signifies something very different. Alejandra is studying means right now, but Angela B studying means habitually, two very different things. But if a language model were created based on this training data, whether statistical or neural, we know that if a user of an ASR system were to say Angela B studying, the most likely outcome is that the ASR would spit back Angela is studying, which we know now means something very different and would be incorrect. Move now to the research questions for this study. The overall study goal was to examine four spoken corpora widely used for ASR development and evaluation for habitual B. Then compare the results with a spoken corpus of AAL and its contents of habitual B. If the results are similar, the ASR corpora will likely not contribute to biased outcomes for AAL speakers who utilize habitual B. But the opposite is also true. If the results are not similar between the four spoken ASR corpora and the spoken African American language corpus, then it's likely that these ASR corpora do contribute to bias against uh, African American language speakers who use habitual B. Research questions for this study. One, how frequently does habitual B occur within four, the four ASR corpora as compared to an AAL reference corpus? Two, how are the occurrences of habitual B dispersed throughout four ASR corpora as compared to an AAL corpus? Three, how is habitual B used in the context of each occurrence within four ASR corpora as compared to an AAL reference corpus? In this context, frequency means the number of instances of habitual B in a corpus, how many times it happens. The dispersion is a measure of how a habitual, how habitual B is distributed throughout a corpus, whether it shows up in different files or not. And finally, usage is the content of words immediately adjacent to habitual B, or the context of habitual B, which is important for things like bigrams, trigrams, and other n-gram models. Let's talk now about methodology. First, let's talk about the corpora that we'll use. We first have Switchboard and Fisher. Switchboard and Fisher are both corpora that are conversational data that is that was gathered um, from telephone conversations arranged by a computer system. Switchboard in this case is actually the combination of Switchboard and Hub5, an, an additional set of 40 interviews that is subsumed under Switchboard. We also have LibreSpeech, which is a spoken corpus of read books from the LibriVox, LibriVox audio book recordings. 
And finally, we have timid, a spoken corpus of read sentences that were constructed to elicit the most di diverse set of phonological or pronunciation variation possible in the English language to be used with ASR systems development. Those are our folk for ASR corpora, and we will compare that to one African-American language corpus, the Corpus of Regional African-American Language. This is a corpus of uh, social linguistic interviews with African-American speakers over many time periods in different regions of the United States. You can see the differences between the corpora corpor here. I would like to point out the size of the corpus and the number of words. You can see on the, on the side that Corel is uh, much smaller than most of the other corpora except Timid. Um, in terms of demographic information available, many of the corpora do not give racial or ethnic identity. Switchboard Fisher and Liver Speech do not. Timid does, um, and we can see explicitly that 85% of its speakers are white and only 4% are black. Um, that immediately throws up a red flag to say that there might be bias here already. Corel, Corel obviously is a corpus of African-American speakers, so it is 100% African-American. And finally, at the bottom, you can see a number of the different uh, major developers that use these corpora either to develop or evaluate their systems. To evaluate these, to compare these corpora, first, the text from the corpora were fed into a Python script that was written to remove XML light word tags, transcribe pauses, speaker IDs, timestamps, but things like uh, paralinguistic and metalinguistic information like laughter was not removed in order to make the conversational corpora more similar to that of libra speech, which being a red book would have more explicit paralinguistic uh, information included. Uh, these clean texts were then uh, submitted to Wordsmith tools, which is a widely used corpus linguistics tool. Um, and concordance lines were uh, produced where the every instance of B was, uh, was gathered. This was sorted by case sensitive L1 or one word to the left of B, non case sensitive L2 or two words to the left of B, and then non case sensitive R1 or one word to the right of B. A spreadsheet was then created that include, included line number, line content, and file name. The total number of B, whether habitual or non habitual, um, were tallied and normalized per 100,000 words. Uh, that normalization process gives us a way to compare the different corpora, even though they are of different sizes. Each line was then tagged for habituality. So each line was uh, read to see if the B in that sentence uh, encapsulated the habitual characteristic or not, and it was tagged that way. The raw frequency of habitual B was tallied, and it was normalized per 100,000 words again, to give us a, uh, an accurate comparison between the different size corpora. A raw total number of the files that contain habitual B instances for each corpus was tallied, and then the percentage of texts that contain habitual B was then calculated for each corpus. Finally, for usage, concordance lines were divided from L3, three words to the left of B, and R3, three words to the right of habitual B, and separated by word. L1 and R1, part of speech, were tagged, the most frequent L1 and R1 word types were tallied, and the most frequent L1 and R1 part of speeches were tallied. Let's move now to results. To begin with the frequency, you can see the different corporate sizes here. The number of Bs um, is varies against each corpus according to its size, but when normalized, we can see that generally they're about in the same range. When we move to habitual B, however, you can see that there is a drastic difference in the number of habitual Bs that occur within each corpus especially when we move towards the normalization of habitual B per corpus. For example, we can see here that Corel has a very high number where the rest of them do not. In fact, Fisher has 42 times less instances of habitual B than Corel. Switchboard has 430 times less. Liberspeech has over a thousand times less. And Timit doesn't have any at all. In terms of dispersion, you can see the number of texts here. Whereas the number of texts with habitual B is very drastically different between the different corpora. Over 50% of Corral's texts have an instance of habitual B, where only 2% of liberal speech, 1% of Fisher, less than 1% of Switchboard, and none of him have uh, files that contain habitual B. Finally, for usage, 
Um, in terms of L1 for Corral and Fisher, you can see that the number of L1 types for Corral was much higher than Fisher. Word types just means the, the unique word instances. Um, the number of common L1 types between the two corporate was only 25%, um, meaning that only 25% of the words to one to the left of B in Corral appear in Fisher. Um, Libra speech is even worse. Libra speech only had 11 unique word types and only 8% of the L1 types uh, were held in common between Corral and Libra speech. Um, in terms of parts of speech, um, you can see that uh, Corral had 63% personal and non-referential pronouns um, and Fisher had about 73%. So that tracks a bit better than Libra speech, which only had about 45%, much different um, part of speech distribution there. Further for nouns, you can see that there's 14% for Corral, um, 6% for Fisher, and 5% for Libra speech. In terms of R1, Corral had 180 different word types, whereas Fisher only had 118. And only 29% of the word types that uh, appear in Corral also appear in Fisher. For Libra speech, this gap is even wider. Um, Corral only had 180, whereas Libra speech only had 30. Only 7% of the R1s that appear in Corral appear in Libra speech as well. In terms of parts of speech, um, Corral is much more diverse in that the present participle verbs make up only 34% of its R1s. Fisher tracks pretty well with that at 42%, but Libra speech is much more concentrated at 74%. Um, and this is not a good thing because we would want the parts of speech to be diversified in order to handle a much more wide array of naturally occurring speech. Libra speech would not be able to do that well. Prepositions, one to the right of uh, B in Corral is 12% prepositions, 9% uh, in Fisher and only 2% in Libra speech. Um, these comparisons show us uh, differences between Corral, Fisher, and Libra speech. Uh, again, we didn't examine switchboard because it only had three instances of habitual B in total and Timmet had none. Finally, let's talk about discussion and conclusion. In terms of frequency, we see that there is there are very large gaps in how many times habitual B happens between the corpora. In Corral, it happens fairly frequently, whereas in the rest, it um, does not happen hardly at all. In terms of dispersion, over half of the files in Corral contain habitual B whereas um, for the rest of them, uh, very, very few at all contain habitual B. In terms of usage for Libra speech, there's very little lexical overlap with Corral, and it's not nearly as syntactically as diverse as Corral. Um, and with Fisher, there, it's missing over 70% of word types on either side of B in Corral. Finally, with demographics, remember we saw that Timid had only 4% black speakers, and the others, we have no idea, but if Timid is any indication, likely they didn't have all that many either. And so all of these combined lead us to conclude that habitual B is woefully underrepresented in spoken corpora, widely used in the ASR corpora in all areas, frequency, dispersion, and usage. These findings could portend the same lack of representation for other AAL unique linguistic features as well. It is highly probable that ASR is developed or evaluated with these corporate function more poorly for speakers who utilize the linguistic features of African American language, such as habitual B. Uh, limitations in future directions. There are many more uh, AAL morphosyntactic or grammatical features that must be examined. Um, also, AAL phonetic or phonological or sound or pronunciation features must be examined as well. And this study only postulates the effects of, on ASR language models. This needs to be tested. And finally, more awareness to racial bias in spoken corpora is needed. Thank you very much. Feel free to email me or reach out or come see me during the Q&A session.